Thank you to Nebula and CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. Bonus content alongside this video is available at free on Nebula. At the start of 2020, we all got used to a view like this. Government officials and scientists took to the stage to announce that a pandemic was spreading throughout the world. Things aren't too bad right now in our country, they'd say, but expect things to get worse over the next couple of weeks as the virus spreads. If we take decisive action right now, though, we could prevent the virus from getting out of control. We still see things get worse for a time, but if we hold our nerve, we'll reduce the suffering overall and we can get back to our lives. This report is much the same. Prior to this news conference, there were five others of increasingly certain, increasingly stern warnings. But the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 1 Assessment Report 6, to give it its full title, released in August 2021, feels to me the most like an early pandemic press conference. In the eight years since the last report, enough cases have occurred, enough evidence has built up that there really can no longer be any doubt that we are on the verge of something serious. The only difference is that it's going to be playing out over decades and centuries, rather than hopefully just a couple of years. In fact, just in case you're not going to make it through this whole video, let me shrink that timescale down even further and summarise it in four bullet points. Climate change right now is like the pandemic was towards the start, in that things aren't terrible right now. They're not great, but they're not that bad. But they will get worse in the immediate future. We really want to avoid the really bad stuff that will happen if we do nothing about this situation, which is going to be very bad indeed. But if we take action now, decisively and with full force, we can avoid a potential catastrophe. Right, let's talk about that in a bit more detail. I'm mostly going to talk at the level of the summary for policymakers in this video. For some accessible reporting on the technical summary, which is one step more complicated, go to the ever-excellent Carbon Brief for their coverage, linked below. The IPCC report summarises what we know to date. The things aren't going that good. Humans have increased the concentration of various greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, and this has caused the Earth's surface temperature to increase on average by 1 degree Celsius, though there's a significant deviation from that number depending on where exactly you are. At the same time, extremely hot weather has become more frequent and more intense, and where there's enough information to say, we think that extreme precipitation events, so heavy rainfall for example, has become more frequent and more intense. These factors combined have led to a situation where extreme events like drought and famine have become more likely, and events that are so extreme we've never even seen them before have also become more likely. That's what we're living through right now, but of course that's not all. Most of the report is concerned with what further changes the climate is going to experience in the future, some of which we are already locked into, committed to because of our actions to date, but most of which depend on what we do now and in the immediate future. Perhaps not surprisingly, there's a lot of bad news in this section, but I am pleased to say I think there's some positive news hiding in there too. The report sets out visions of the future called Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, or SSPs. These represent possible societal responses to climate change, ranging from the optimistic, cutting emissions very quickly and removing lots of carbon from the atmosphere in the late century, to the realistic, cutting emissions slowly or barely at all, to the worst case scenario. Each of these scenarios has a variety of expected impacts associated with them, though there are commonalities between the different scenarios. Generally speaking, we expect a phenomenon to occur in response to the globe warming, but the intensity of that phenomenon, that response, increases as the global warming increases in value. So a world that's warmed by 3 degrees will see the same changes as a world that's warmed by 2 degrees, just more intensely. The main takeaway from this is that the observed changes we've seen in temperature and precipitation and extreme events will intensify as the planet continues to warm. So each additional degree of warming brings with it more and more extreme changes, more and more extreme conditions, but not uniformly. So in temperature specifically, for example, we expect some parts of the world to warm by over three times the global average. So while there may be a global warming of, say, three degrees Celsius, some parts of the world will warm by over nine degrees. 
The IPCC actually built a great interactive tool allowing you to see how this will play out worldwide. I'll link that below. But as well as that main takeaway of intensifying effects that we've already seen, there are some incredibly concerning secondary effects hidden in these pages that we haven't seen just yet, but we probably will in the coming years. To talk about them, I called on a friend of mine from when I was doing my PhD, Professor Matt Collins, who's a professor in climate change at the University of Exeter and the Met Office. Matt's worked extensively with the IPCC before, including on the last assessment report, AR5. One of his main research interests is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, and its expected impact in a warming world is one of the most troubling things to me in this report. El Nino events are associated with dry monsoon years, and that's the, you know, that, that is a considerable um, of considerable importance to agriculture in India, particularly in the, in the plains, wheat and rice, you know, fairly staple crops, actually. Having one, one bad year followed by one good year followed one, by one bad year, which might be a sort of scenario we see if you see an increase in ENSO variability, could be pretty devastating. In a warmer world, we can, among other places, expect the Indian subcontinent to receive increasingly variable amounts of rainfall. And no agricultural technology on Earth is going to be able to overcome the challenge of repeated drought years. So as the world warms, we can expect the global food supply, and perhaps specifically the food supply in a place where a billion people currently live, to become increasingly precarious. One of the other incredibly worrying things highlighted in this report is the possibility of irreversible changes. Things that we've already set in motion in the natural world through our emissions to date, and now can't be undone. So things like ice sheets are impacted by the, by the radiative forcing, but also by the ocean warming. And that ocean warming is something which has a very long time scale. There's a big inertia in the system there. So any imbalance in the radiative um, forcing of the atmosphere now will be felt in the ocean for many hundreds of years. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the kind of worry when it comes to ice sheets, that you can have this destabilizing effect of the ocean water going underneath the, the ice sheets. Irreversible, of course, is a definitive thing, but really irreversible for climate timescales means irreversible in the next few hundred years. Unless you're talking about something like the Greenland ice sheet or the Antarctic ice sheet, which could be really irreversible. There's a variety of points like this in the report, and yes, we should be very concerned about them. But I, I don't want to lead you to despair, because I do think that amongst all of this bad news, there are a few bits of good news buried in there as well. First of all, we have a much better idea of what we're up against. I mean that broadly, but specifically, the report gives a tighter estimate of what's called the Earth's ECS, or Equilibrium Climate Sensitivity. This is how much warming we'd expect to see eventually after doubling the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. What's really happened is that the, the lower bound has sort of snuck up a bit. So it was, you know, maybe one point five degrees and maybe it's now two, two point five degrees. And I think that's really been associated with a huge piece of work done by people on cloud feedbacks um, and really kind of trying to nail down what those the uncertainties associated with cloud feedbacks and seeing that those are, you know, cloud feedbacks are essentially positive. Uh, and the idea of having negative cloud feedbacks are even components of cloud feedbacks for negative is, is now kind of not really considered to be physically reasonable. That might not sound like good news. After all, it might be a slightly higher climate sensitivity. But with smaller error bars, we better know the enemy we're fighting. And we know how much warming to expect for a given amount of emissions. So we can modify our plans for reducing emissions accordingly. Far better news is this paragraph, stating that one of the biggest potential tipping points in the climate, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, which is a conveyor belt of water in the Atlantic, is unlikely to flip into a different, very weak state, but instead weaken somewhat and then gradually recover, contrary to what one very well-publicised recent paper found. This is good news, as if the AMOC were to switch off, which could be very sudden, then the Northern Hemisphere would sharply cool and become drier, as well as experiencing a likely cataclysm for marine species, which would be felt through the whole biosphere. So we think that's not going to happen, which is 
good news. Another famous climate tipping point that we also think is unlikely to be reached is the release of greenhouse gases like methane from the permafrost in places like Siberia. The fear was that global warming would melt the permafrost in these places and release those greenhouse gases, causing a huge amount of extra warming. But it appears very unlikely that that's going to happen this century, which is very good news. Though Matt did have a word to say on this. I, I, st I still think that that research is pretty difficult to do because of modelling these things and also it's a difficult place in the world to take observations. Um, you know, being up in the Siberian tundra in winter <laughs> it's not really my idea as a modeller of <laughs> the sort of science I want to do. That's a job for a PhD student. <laughs> Perhaps the most positive takeaway from this report is that we are still not committed to catastrophic climate change in the end of three or four degrees Celsius. Because the report highlights that what ultimately matters is the cumulative amount of carbon in the atmosphere, the total amount of carbon that we've put up there for all our activities. That means that if we can get our act together now, really put the brakes on emissions and lower the total cumulative amount of carbon that will end up in the atmosphere, we can avoid a future with frequent extreme droughts and floods and famines and wildfires. It's not too late. But every year that we delay doing something about it, we make the problem worse in the end. When I asked Matt what the most shocking thing in this report was to him, he said this. So if, if you look at the bottom of the, or the, almost the last page of the, the summary for policymakers, there's a section about allowable emissions to avoid uh, different levels of global warming. So we've talked a lot about, well, there's been a lot of talk about 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. And if you look at some of the numbers in that table, um, you know, we're talking a few hundred gigatons of carbon. Now we're currently emitting around 30 to 40 gigatons of carbon. So we could be looking at, you know, only 10 years before we're basically going to cross 1.5 degrees or be committed to crossing 1.5 degrees. Our response to the global pandemic gives us a window into how we'll likely respond to climate change. People, it turned out, were resilient. They were, and society in general was, capable of making huge changes to respond to a dire threat. The way we lived our lives changed. We listened to the experts, heeded their warnings, took action, and eventually saw the situation improve. But I'm sure I'm not the only person who looks back at these early press conferences and feels frustrated. In those crucial early days of the pandemic, decisions were made that had long-lasting consequences. Politicians prevaricated, they hesitated, and only took action reluctantly and often on too small a scale. And because of this, the worst fears of some epidemiologists were realised, and a catastrophic, costly, both monetarily and in human lives, pandemic erupted across the world. Had decisive action been taken early, globally, this wouldn't have happened. There would have been a short-term cost, absolutely, but it pales in comparison to the long-term damage we suffered instead. Let's not make that mistake again. At this press conference, the facts are clear. Things aren't too bad right now, but if we don't take action, now we're going to be looking down the barrel of a far, far greater threat than coronavirus. Every year that we delay taking action, the worse it's going to be. Please don't ignore this warning. Let's get it right this time. Matt was extremely generous with his time, and I was able to ask him a whole bunch of questions about this topic, some of which I was asking on behalf of my supporters on Patreon. Matt's answers to those questions, covering machine learning in climate science and carbon neutrality by 2050 and much more, are available right now on Nebula. You've almost certainly heard of Nebula before, the streaming service owned by a huge collection of educational YouTubers, including me. Here we upload additional content that wouldn't play nicely with the YouTube algorithm, as well as original content such as Better Elevation, a series about how we approach video production, and Neo's fascinating tragic The Unknown City. 
Unlike YouTube, Nebula has no adverts anywhere, on its pages or in its videos. Instead, you pay a subscription fee that gets split between creators, directly supporting our educational work and resulting in a better viewing experience for you. Except you can get completely free access to Nebula if you sign up to our partners, CuriosityStream, the home of the best documentaries on the internet. And why wouldn't you be interested in doing that? If you've watched this video this far, you clearly care about the natural world and so would love the thousands of documentaries on CuriosityStream, from David Attenborough's Light on Earth to Seasons of the Forest. For more information about climate change, you could check out any number of super high quality documentaries they have on the subject. If Nebula is the best of small scale, individual productions, CuriosityStream is the best of big budget, professional productions. It's the perfect combination then to get both in a bundle, which if you go to curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, link below, you can do for 26% off. That's only $14.79 for a year's access to all of this and all of this. It's possibly the best investment you'll ever make in your online viewing, and in supporting educational video online like this. Thank you to CuriosityStream and to Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you for watching the video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If enjoy is really the right word. I have no doubt that I'll be making more videos about this report in the future, but if you'd like to see some of my previous videos on topics in climate change, then you can check some of them out up here. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.